welcome our presenter, Bruce Teeple. Bruce is a writer, speaker, and local historian. He currently serves as president of the Union County Historical Society, as judge and on the state advisory board of the National History Day in Pennsylvania competition, as volunteer coordinator of the Penn State Native American Powwow, and as an instructor for Penn State's Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, OLLI. He has also served as chair of the American Association for State and Local Histories Small Museum Scholarship Committee for 16 years. And he has spoken on various topics before numerous groups and conferences. Bruce, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Let's go ahead and get started. Well, thank you for having me here today. The first things we need to address are the perceptions we have about this hemisphere's original people. Specifically, we need to look at identity and the expectations we place on someone based solely on a false name or an inaccurate portrayal. The concept of identity theft isn't so new. If you let me label you as someone or something, then I've gained an undeserved power over your life. You've just lost everything that's wrapped up in your name, your reputation, your memory, and your sense of self. Languages and dishonest images can distort the way we look at the world and at the past. Much of what we learn or project, unfortunately, comes from TV, movies, and cartoons, what Kurt Anderson calls the fantasy industrial complex. Let's take Tonto, for example. Tonto, for those of us who didn't grow up speaking Spanish, means stupid, dummy, idiot. Tonto, in fact, was a Canadian actor who changed his name from Harold Smith to Jay Silverheels, the name his running track uh, teammates gave him when he was in college. And Madison Avenue's star with the unforgettable tear, tear Chief Iron Eyes Cody, was a second generation Italian American from Louisiana named Espera De Conti. But he looked like what Americans thought an Indian should really look like. We even learned more nonsense in school. For over 200 years, history books portrayed the Seven Years' War or French and Indian War as a stepping stone toward taming the uh, new world as the inevitable triumph of civilization over savagery. They focused on the salacious rather than on the serious, on relatively rare atrocities rather than on the normal daily exchanges between neighbors. The opening salvos of this war were not necessarily random, senseless, unprovoked incidents divorced from events on the world stage. The official records reveal instead decades of decisions reflecting a complex, ever-changing geopolitical reality of competing visions and values. We see the lies already taking shape when the Founding Fathers used blatantly racist language to declare their independence, when they accused the king of having endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. Now we'll hear also an excerpt from an American history textbook published 100 years later in 1871, five years before the Battle of the Little Bighorn. The North American Indians were found in a savage state. They lived in wigwams and supported themselves by hunting and fishing and occasionally raising patches of corn and beans. They were destitute of all that constitutes civilization. Their main delight was war. Their chief interest in their relations with the whites was generally of a hostile character. 
They massacred the early English colonists who established themselves on the coast of North Carolina. When the two permanent settlements were made at Jamestown and Plymouth, these colonies were at various times almost exterminated by the savages. By a strange continuation of the same traits, they have ever since been a source of trouble to the whites. They have repelled all attempts at civilization. And even now, the trains on the great transcontinental railroad are sometimes interrupted by painted warriors, the descendants of the savages who nearly 400 years ago met the earliest Europeans with murderous attacks. It is not for us to say who's to blame. It is true the whites were not always just and prudent in their dealings with the Indians. But apart from this, there seems to be hostility between the Indian character and civilization. And it is not to be doubted that in a few more years, the red men will have disappeared from the American continent. Well, enough of that. I get a lot of questions about the people who once lived here in central Pennsylvania. The most common ones being, who lived here? Where did they live? And did anything happen here? But if this program is to have any relevance, we need to frame it around some other questions. Why are things the way they are? How do I know what I think I know is true? And what is the role of change in our lives? Whether we call the original people Indians, Native Americans, or First Nations, everyone finds something offensive or objectionable. No single approach does justice to a society's complexity if it ignores the different ways people adapt and survive in the face of environmental and political change. To understand any people, we first need to look at their surrounding landscape. There's a tremendous difference between the sandstone ridges and limestone valleys in this part of the state where we live, as opposed to the landscape north of Interstate 80 along Route 15, as you travel from Williamsport to the New York border. Every one of these horizontal lines or striations represents a separate glacier, several hundred feet thick coming down depositing rocks and dirt, compressing what's underneath, and then retreating to the north. There's some debate over how long ago the first people came to North America from Asia through the Bering Strait land bridge. As far as we know, though, the first people to enter this region, people we call hunters and gatherers, came here as the last glaciers moved out about 12,000 years ago. The cool marshlands at Bear Meadows, south of Bullsburg, are a rare vestige of central Pennsylvania's last ice age environment and provide a glimpse into the inhospitable landscape these people experienced. What I'm holding here is not an arrowhead. The technical term is lithic projectile point. It's a spear point, maybe 6,000 years old. <clears throat> These people hunted migrating herds of antelope, <coughs> excuse me, elk and deer by roving in small bands over hundreds of miles and throwing stone tip spears. Bows and arrows with fingertip size points, such as this one, which is only about an inch long, were not introduced until about two to 4,000 years ago. Now you can't make these points out of any old rock, such as limestone or sandstone. Spear points were usually made from flint, chert, rhyolite, or jasper. Local jasper sources were dug out of the hill between Beaver Stadium and the hospital, where Penn State's Jim Hatch led some digs a few years ago. <clears throat> Jasper deposits formed when a meteor once slammed into the Chesapeake Bay, forcing mantle stuff to ooze up through weak areas in the Earth's crust. 
It naturally occurs as a yellowish brown color, like the color of this point. Through a process called conchoidal fracturing, you spend hours flaking off slivers of these stones until you get the desired shape and sharpness. This jasper point that I initially showed is red because someone held it over a fire. Heat not only changed the color, it became easier to shape. There are documented sites identified throughout Penns Valley having many of these points. Woodbrook Cave, Beaver Dam Schoolhouse, and the area around what I call the uh, Center Hall International Airport. But finding masses of spear points at a specific location doesn't mean these are battlefields. More than likely, there are traditional campsites dating back six to 12,000 years. And what we find at these sites are either someone's stash or their trash. Not long ago, researchers compared the effect of different weapons on a two inch thick oak plank. And the results were astounding. An arrow shot from a bow stuck fast. A 30-06 bullet fired from a deer rifle passed through the board. But one of these spears hurled with an extension, a hooked bone or stick called an atolatl, shattered that board. So you don't let the simplicity fool you. These are extremely lethal weapons for taking down large animals. <clears throat> Early maps of central Pennsylvania show a relatively bare landscape called the Great Plains, stretching at least 30 miles west from Spring Mills. Such a large expanse was rare for the area we call Penn's Woods, that nonstop 300 mile sea of trees from the Delaware River Valley to the Ohio River Valley. 18th century missionary Philip Vickers Fithian speculated in his diary that native people may have deliberately set the area on fire to encourage big game populations. Anthropologists now believe that if these people used fire to clear land, it was on a considerably smaller and controlled scale to encourage the growth of nut trees. So these great plains were most likely the result of fires from a perfectly natural accidental lightning strike. Here's another challenge to any preconceptions you may have about these societies. Hunter-gatherer cultures generally do not assign tasks solely according to gender. That's a luxury you can't afford when everyone's daily survival is at stake. Archeologists have found that by examining prehistoric burial sites throughout the Western hemisphere, about 40% of prehistoric hunters were probably women. The sites often have women buried with points used in hunting with larger stones for breaking bones and stripping hides in addition to various scrapers and knives. These are matrilineal societies where you trace your family through your mother. This makes sense since you usually know who your mother is, but you don't always know who's your father. Women generally own the property. Women decided when and where to camp. Women decided when to fight and when to stop. And women decided which captives stayed and which ones didn't because they recognized that men come and go. But women had, to most, had the most to lose because they are the ones who hold the things together. Whenever I tell younger audiences this, the girls inevitably raise their fists up and down with a resounding yes. As the climate warmed about 6,000 years ago, the hunters and gatherers settled down in the fertile river valleys to grow crops. More species of plants and animals entered the region. New sources of protein from beans, maize, corn, chestnut, and hickory nuts also improved their diets, diets contributing to a dramatic increase in overall life expectancy. The large leaves of squash, pumpkin, and gourd vines 
trapped in moisture and smothered invasive weeds. Their flesh and seeds not only provided extra nutrients, their outer shells, when dried, also could store a surplus for the winter months. But it wasn't just the diet that helped people live longer. Have, many of, have any of you ever suffered from Montezuma's revenge? That same diarrhea and potentially fatal dehydration afflict all hunter-gatherer societies around the world as they move from location to location and adapt to changing bacteria levels in their sources of drinking water. Agriculturalists were now staying at one place, farming those areas <clears throat> for maybe 10 or 20 years before moving again as foil, soil fertility and crop yields declined. They began to organize themselves for protection into loose political units, clans, if you will, that shared a common nut language, culture, and the kinship ties, but not necessarily a concentrated decision-making structure. The term tribe isn't quite accurate because that word often connotes a substandard or inferior level of social development. We don't call the Polish people or the German or English, Italian or French people tribes, do we? It doesn't quite ring right in our ears. That's because we say they are ethnic groups and the same should apply with the indigenous people of this hemisphere. Generic terms such as Indian are meaningless. They ignore the complexity and sophistication of their decision-making. Even though I use the names most, most groups today call themselves, we need to remember that many of these names are European pronunciations or mispronunciations of the original. Other names such as Conestoga, date from periods after disease and warfare took their toll and forced survivors to regroup, coalesce, and forge new identities. For the time being though, we'll begin by summarizing what little we know about the first agriculturalists who inhabited central Pennsylvania before their contact with Europeans. About a thousand years ago, the earliest agricultural group that we know of we call the Clemson Island people. They lived in the Susquehanna watershed and left pot shards there. Over the next 500 years, the Shanks Ferry people replaced or possibly absorbed the Clemson Island group. Then the Susquehannocks moved into the region, probably in a bid to be middlemen in a newer worldwide economy. And that economy involved controlling the exchange of furs for goods from Europe. And it was this fur trade that first ripped apart the social fabric of this continent's indigenous nations. If you travel along Route 45 between Spring Mills and the hamlet of Penn Hall, there's a vast wetland with a handful of houses hugging the highway's edge. But how and why is that wetland there? As the name of the old schoolhouse down a nearby road indicates, it was the site of an enormous system of beaver dams. As the beaver population declined from overhunting, the dams fell apart and the water spilled out. Thousands of years of accumulated rotted detritus, or what we call compost, remained. The Susquehannocks, acting somewhat as some subcontractors, you might say, for the Europeans, soon realized the Susquehanna watershed's beaver population could not satisfy Europe's insatiable demand for the fashionable waterproof pelts. To meet this artificial market demand, they looked to the Great Lakes and became allies with the Huron people to secure their supply of pelts. These Susquehannocks were called Taquos, Andastes, and Minquas by the English, French, and the Dutch, respectively, but everyone described them as hostile. Native people to the north called the lands on the west side of the river Atsanaxan, that, that is the place of demons. 
Moravian missionaries took that term literally, believing inhabitants on the west side of the river had supernatural powers. As Bucknell historian Catherine Fall notes, however, the region and the time have been unfairly maligned by historians quoting one missionary, Martin Mack, who called the region the very seat of the Prince of Darkness. This statement, though, is not from a primary source. It is from a secondary source, a memoir that Mack wrote and published decades later, a product of his aging, faulty memory. Unfortunately, the damage was done as historians repeated that description for 200 years. When Fall translated Mack's original 1745 diary entries, she found he gave a much more realistic picture. While not exactly idyllic, the journey to the Susquehanna Valley was more pleasant and the area more peaceful than the simmering cauldron later historians depicted as existing here. In fact, the Susquehannock's legendary ferocity had nothing to do with otherworldly powers or practices. On the contrary, they were ruthlessly protecting their far-flung fur trade routes. All right, there we go. There we go. Okay. Every indigenous group saw itself as an equal player, as holding all the cards and being in charge while strategically playing the Europeans against each other. Moravian minister Johannes Heckevelder described native negotiators as displaying, quote, as much skill and dexterity perhaps as any people upon earth in the management of their national affairs. Susquehannock communities benefited from this complex trade network for a while, but maintaining this constant contact with Europeans proved to be a devil's bargain. Never ending conflict and competition with other groups combined with exposure to smallpox germs carried by Europeans brought this group to its knees within 15 years by 1675, just a few years before William Penn landed on these shores. By satisfying the European demand for animal pelts, younger generations succumbed to the market economies temptations, but all that convenience came with a price. Why bother tanning hides when you can buy blankets? Why hunt with spears when hunting with a bow and arrow makes you more efficient by increasing the distance from your target? Why hunt with a bow and arrow when guns are even more efficient? All that technology transfer was fine as long as the gunpowder and bullets were available to satisfy the fur market. But what do you do when the British trading post refuses to sell you gunpowder and bullets? And what do you do when you no longer know how to make tools and weapons the old way? When you've lost that ancient knowledge and skill? The first half of the 1700s was not a blank slate where nothing happened. When William Penn first arrived here in the 1680s, he focused on establishing his holy experiment on the orderly development of a green country town. Its design would always be wholesome by encouraging settlers to emulate Christ-like behavior. Penn rejected Europe's traditional rural landscape patterns. Farmers there, lived for centuries in towns encircled wheel-like by semi-communal fields. Penn envisioned his province as a series of grids with each 5,000 acre township or village limited to 10 families. Every property would adjoin a waterway for easier transportation, but this vision of peaceful coexistence of a beloved community gradually evaporated. Achieving this ideal commonwealth had to involve a comparatively fair but fragile system of land transfers through forest diplomacy. Disease and absorption by neighboring groups had for all intents and purposes destroyed the Susquehannocks. 
the province's center was a void soon to be filled. But Penn's great peace began to disintegrate by the time he died in 1718, and it ended 37 years later with the tragic events near John Penn's Creek at a spot between Mifflinburg and New Berlin. This date, 16 October 1755, and that tragedy marked the final break in the relations William Penn carefully cultivated when purchasing lands from the original people. What occurred there affected the mindsets of central Pennsylvanians, indeed of all Americans, and their notions about the original people. Who can deny the powerful image of a German hymn reuniting two girls with an old woman after nine years of captivity? But history shows us time and again that the stories we read and heard are not so black and white, that other sides of a story fill our awareness and understanding with shades of gray. 19th century newspaper editors and recent filmmakers exaggerated and exploited this heartbreaking tale about love, loss, and reunion, but their slanted viewpoints also made an indelible impression on generations of school children. The faded newsprints and ticket stubs washed away in an ocean of tears. The tracks of those tears, unfortunately, should have flowed down those thousands of cheeks for slightly different reasons. The problem with this tale is that it begs the question, why did it happen? We never heard of the 30 years of frustration and betrayals preceding this event when our teachers read the story to us. It wasn't senseless or random or savage. Far from it, given the temper of the time. To appreciate what happened here in our own backyard, we need to look at the unraveling of that forest diplomacy and the fate of Pennsylvania's original people. Ignoring the passions, the distortions, and the complexity of yesterday's decision-making leaves a ripple effect that over time compounds the misunderstanding. So who were these people of the Eastern Woodlands? Contrary to the Europeans' projections, the multiple ethnic groups of North America's Eastern Woodlands were not a monolithic force of Indians. Their interests and attitudes were as diverse as the invaders. We can separate these people of the Eastern Woodlands into two major language categories, the Iroquoian speaking people and the Algonquin speaking people. The Iroquoian speaking Haudenosaunee or people of the Longhouse lived across present day Northern Pennsylvania and New York state. Hiawatha and the peacemaker known as the Ganawida used that common Iroquoian language base to create a political union about 800 years ago. The French called the Haudenosaunee Iroquois. The English called them the five, later six nations. The Mohawks lived in the East, but they didn't call themselves Mohawk. Mohawk is an ethnic slur in the Algonquin language. It means cannibal. It's the worst thing you could call somebody. They actually called themselves Kanyangahaga, or people of the flint, meaning they were the first to receive flintlock firearms from the Dutch in the Hudson River Valley. The Senecas lived in the West with the Onondaga, Oneida, and Cayuga nations scattered in between. The Tuscarora people, plagued by the double threat of enslavement and the illegal liquor trade down South, moved north in 1722 and became the sixth nation of the Haudenosaunee Confederation. The Haudenosaunee frequently clashed with their, what I call their linguistic cousins, the Susquehannocks, over controlling the fur trade until smallpox carried by Dutch and Swedish traders raced up the river and effectively decimated the Susquehannock population. The problem with this disease was that first, they had no resistance 
to it. And second, their traditional treatment for sickness, crawling into the tight, warm, humid confines of sweat lodges, did not alleviate symptoms, it exacerbated them. This was part of a wider Holocaust. 90% of the indigenous population along the entire Eastern seaboard had already perished from European diseases by 1700. As historian Francis Jennings described the bodies littering the Pennsylvania countryside, this was not a virgin land when the invaders arrived. It was a widowed one. Speakers of Algonquin dialects, the other major language group, ranged over the Eastern seaboard from the Carolinas to the Great Lakes. These included, but were not limited to, the Shawnee and Lenape people. English invaders named the Eastern River in honor of Thomas West, <clears throat> third Baron de la War. For the sake of convenience, they also called the Lenape inhabitants of the region Delawares. Most of William Penn's direct transactions were with the Lenape. Their social expectations differed considerably from Europeans. The, the invaders did not like the loose democratic ways Lenape made decisions. They undermined the traditional role of women and insisted on imposing more hierarchical structures and titles like viceroy and regent and chief and king. One individual was even called, for whatever reason, half king. These unfamiliar demands by this foreign market economy disrupted social and political traditions. Material goods from Europe often mentioned in the exchanges were distributed within a clan to cement the social standing of an individual male leader. As a result, these small independent clans now measured a newly established spokesman's status, not by how much wisdom he had or by how much he accumulated, but by how many gifts and how much liquor he could give away. Central Pennsylvania's other major Algonquin speaking group were the Shawnee people who migrated into the Juniata River Valley and along the North Branch, but we'll discuss their, the role they played in a few minutes. Before we go any further in discussing the political situation, let's take a moment to review some more misperceptions. Contemporary artist Robert Griffin has done outstanding work in portraying Eastern Woodlands people, as described by one of their most honest and accurate chroniclers, Johannes Heckevelder. Let's look for a moment. What's the first thing that drum, jumps out at you? What are these fellows holding? Not spears, not bows and arrows, no, guns. You also don't see them wearing ceremonial feathered headdresses. Those would not have been practical when walking through the thick Eastern forests. Headdresses were worn on the open Western plains. No, it was more practical for Eastern Woodlands men to shave their heads. Notice their ears. Those are not ear rings. They cut, slit, and stretch their earlobes and reinforce them with sinew, animal muscle tissue, to make a fashion statement. Heckewelder noted, however, that many of these men were missing whole sections of their ears that overhanging tree branches had snagged and ripped off. Also, because the earlobe is cartilage with little blood flow, these isolated extremities are more susceptible to breaking when exposed to freezing temperatures. Their net work of paths were only about a foot and a half wide through the forest, so it was easy not only for this damage to occur, it also was quite common for anyone, native or European, to get lost. I'm sure most of you have taken aspirin. Whenever native people had pain, they drank willow bark soup. The active ingredient in willow bark soup is salicylic acid, which the Bayer Company it first isolated and sold in Germany as aspirin in the 1890s. We can also thank native people for introducing the notion of camouflage to blend in with surroundings. 
And how many of you have taken a bath or a shower in the past year, in the past month, in the past few days? You can thank, or maybe I should say the rest of us can thank the original people for that. The joke among them was that because of Europeans' inattention to personal hygiene, you could smell Europeans before you even saw them coming. Like all Eastern Woodland communities, they lived in structures that lasted from 10 to 20 years before uprooting and moving to a more fertile location. The smaller structures, wigwams, were arched frames overlaid with bark, hides, or mats using the same shingling principles as the thatch roofs of Europe. Wigwams generally were used as path-side shelters during hunting expeditions. Fithian mentions these structures in his diary while traveling along Bald Eagle Creek in 1775. Most agricultural communities of the Eastern Woodlands erected longhouses to shelter extended families. These immense structures were about 20 feet wide and anywhere from 50 to 250 feet long. Pennsylvania has over 200 place names of native origin, more than any other state. Place names not only tell us who lived where, they also illustrate differing mindsets. The clues are in plain sight. Place names with the word beaver, beaver town, beaver springs, beaver falls, or field, Deerfield, Springfield, Clearfield, are usually a tip off that that land was previously cleared, occupied and abandoned by either beavers and the compost they left or indigenous people. Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Bedford, Lancaster, only tell us that these locations were named after some faraway person or place. These names are useless. They don't tell us anything about the location. Now, whether it's algebra, literature, physics, history, the point of learning is always to look for patterns. And the same applies to languages. No one was going around grunting, ug or how. There were many different people speaking many different languages and dialects of those languages. It's just as complex with grammar, cases, and declensions as English. There is always something lost in translation. Lenape words, for example, have no R sound. So attempts at producing, pronouncing rum came out as lum. Many Lenape words have a guttural ung, ung sound. That, so we have Punxsutawney, Shenango, Venango, Montongo, Equinunk, Mahanoi. Following the same pattern, we also get the words skunk and chipmunk. Then there are the Hano words, Susquehanna, Kuwenhanna, Loyalhanna. Moshannon, and then there's state colleges, Wapalani, or Bald Eagle, a local Lenape leader. Shawnee words also crop up in our daily usage. South of the Seven Mountains, the Shawnee settled in the Juniata River Valley, as evidenced by the place names there. Cunyata, or Juniata, means standing stone. We also have the word Kishikaquilis, which means den of snakes. Of course, Kishik Aquilis is a bit of a tongue twister, so the Mifflin County School District changed its name to Indian Valley, presumably so sports broadcasters would have an easier time of it. And the same goes for the bank that short, simply shortened its name to Kish Bank. Of course, as folks may want to consider changing it again once they learn what Kishik Aquilis actually means. Pennsylvania's early decision makers not only had shifting ideas about their physical and psychological places in the world, they also constantly pulled diplomatic sleights of hand to acquire more land. Over a dozen languages and dialects echoed through the air at these treaty negotiations, leaving the proceedings open to charges of mistranslation and deliberate deceit. You can imagine the confusion and the potential for mistranslation 
misunderstanding, and outright fraud occurring at these treaty negotiations when you have all these different languages and dialects being spoken. Just like playing whispering down the lane. Official scribes struggled to capture the soaring oratory reflecting legitimate native grievances. The spoken word was sacred to these people. Their sincerity and use of metaphors reinforced the power of their arguments. They viewed the mysterious marks that the invaders made on paper as insulting, mere scribbles conveying as much meaning, seriousness, and sense of obligation as chicken scratches in the dirt. <clears throat> there were as many differences, competing influences, and shifting alliances among indigenous people as there were among Europeans. Necessity and greed led William Penn's heirs and their unchecked representatives to upend his tradition of fair treatment. Hordes of European invaders ignored the carefully worded treaty terms. Penn's efforts, however well-intentioned, reminded these arrivals of large landowners back in Europe and their attempts to control agricultural economies. The Ulster Scots, with their insatiable hunger for more land and conquering people at any cost, resented and rejected any restrictions on their activity. Many were squatters who swarmed onto the proprietor's prime manor lands, rejecting this vestige of the feudal system by refusing to pay quit rents to Penn's sons. These invaders tossed aside long-standing traditions. They distilled and dissolved subtle ethnic and linguistic distinctions among indigenous people into simpler generalities, now based on skin color. Reports of wholesale massacres spiraling, spiraling out from local disputes, skirmishes, and blood feuds would rationalize genocide over time. Any dreams of peace, justice, and mutual respect succumb to the stark, impersonal, vicious realities of supply and demand. Penn's agents fanned across Europe's German-speaking duchies and provinces with pamphlets spreading the word about the religious and political freedoms promised in Pennsylvania. 18th century perceptions of space and time are radically different from ours today. Few Germans arriving before 1740 bothered to secure the special permission they needed from the legislature, a regulation designed to control intermixing of Germans with the more uh, boisterous Ulster Scots. The farther the Germans settled from Penn's communitar communitarian confines, the more, they re more receptive they were to adopting innovative, innovative agricultural practices. Unlike other newcomers, an ethnic German not only regarded his remote farmstead as a multi-generational investment, he also made it the center of his life. As one astounded traveler remarked, people live so far apart that many have to walk a quarter or a half an hour just to reach their nearest neighbor. Villages anchored by a, a mill, a blacksmith, or a church were often left to evolve at a crossroads. The closer these establishments were to a major traffic artery, the greater their long-term chances to diversify and succeed. The mysterious figures emerging out of the misty forests did not see themselves as Indians. In their eyes, they stood on a divided, but equal footing with those European invaders. Land to them was not a commodity. They didn't put a price tag on every square inch. It was a resource whose fruits were gifts to share or exchange, to claim, clear, and settle in a place permanently never made sense to these people. To them, a community's intimate, Sustainable relationship with the land was ever-changing and renewed as every generation moved to a new place. 
They regarded the fertile soils and abundant herds of game animals as resources to share, not as was the case with Europeans, as strictly demarcated possessions to hold exclusively forever. It was a sustainable system focused on long-term responsibility to future generations rather than on short-term exploitation. Native people defined their environment by its use. It wasn't as if they didn't believe in property rights. Agricultural agreements were informal understandings rather than formal contractual relationships. Women owned and worked specific fields, but the community members burned brush, erected weirs to catch fish and eels, and harvested their crops together. Both Europeans and indigenous people held similar traditional notions about common lands, such as forests and other undeveloped areas, where they hunted or gathered berries, herbs, and firewood, but claiming that common land for oneself forever was unthinkable. Minor conflicts over what constituted a commons area still arose. When indigenous people and European invaders lived too close to each other, Disputes over common land often broke out because of misunderstandings. One frequent complaint involved, involved the time-honored custom of Europeans letting their, their hogs either stray onto neighboring native fields or forage freely for mast on the forest floor. This practice, however, violated no, native notions about property rights, as well as the ecological promises they strove to keep for future generations. As the land transfers between the Pens and the Lenape multiplied, so did overlapping and conflicting claims amid the invaders' demands for more land. Waves of European arrivals expected to fulfill the promise of a new life here, forcing a mass exodus of Lenape refugees out of the east and into the central Susquehanna Valley. William Penn's heirs and their representatives lit the long fuse when they abandoned Penn's policy of fair treatment through treaty negotiations. As Penn's health declined, James Logan, the Penn family's colonial secretary, would gain virtual control over land sales and the Susquehanna fur trade for almost 20 years. The pens were desperate. They needed to stabilize their precarious financial situation. And as we'll see, these changes in policy would pay off handsomely over time. The biggest obstruction was the Ladape's obstinacy. James Logan did not like their de democratic decision making process, with women having the final word. The European invaders had fixed, rigid perceptions of themselves and their nuclear families that were anchored in national origin, religion, and skin color. In contrast, native men could hunt and negotiate, but because women had the most at stake by maintaining stability and continuity, they authorized the final decisions. One's definition of self in these matrilineal societies was more fluid and based on age, language, and extended kinship ties with everyone called grandmother, uncle, or a similar honorific. Their loose political protocols and these piecemeal, sometimes overlapping purchases were too messy, too, too inconvenient, too inefficient. It was easier for James Logan to load up a hand-picked king or chief with gifts and liquor to swing negotiations in Logan's favor. For the sake of convenience and efficiency, James Logan looked around for a native ally. Such a group, presumably with a less vested interest, could assist in relocating any Lenape from the east to the Susquehanna frontier. As early as 1726, the Haudenosaunee Confederation had seen the strategic value of the Susquehanna Valley and tried to orchestrate this chaos in their favor. First, the Cayugas 
approach the Lenape refugees and encouraged them to attack the English, but the Lenape already knew they were considerably weakened. There was also another Algonquin speaking group, the Shawnee people who played a major role in this story. Like the Tuscarora, the Shawnee had been wandering up from the south and spreading throughout the Juniata and upper Susquehanna valleys, hoping to escape both enslavement and the illegal rum traffic. All this time, James Logan was reassuring the Shawnee that they'd be free of alcohol's influence, but uh, he did little to stop his trading network from selling liquor to any of the Lenape or Shawnee, especially around the time of land sale negotiations. The Haudenosaunee Confederation also wanted the Shawnee to settle in this valley and provide strategically placed rest stops. These Haudenosaunee warriors expected elaborate welcoming ceremonies at these rest stops to honor their safe passage as they trekked down south hundreds of miles through thick forests, raided the Cherokee Creek and Catawba communities and brought back prisoners. It didn't take long though for the Shawnee to see through this charade. They resented these interlopers from the north. So the Shawnee eventually moved out west to the Ohio River country. James Logan's at a standstill by 1728. The Lenape were refusing to acknowledge the legitimacy of Logan's wheeling and dealing. They only wanted to deal, to negotiate directly with the Pens. To ease the situation, the Haudenosaunee Confederation appointed one of their own, an Oneida named Enlightener, to observe, referee, and report everything. In the Iroquoian language, Enlightener's name was Swatana, but history knows him by the Algonquin equivalent, Shikalemi. What little we know of Shikalemi's life illustrates the changing realities of native identity. Most accounts state that his birthplace was Montreal, but there's no record of his birth year. It's also come down that his mother was probably Cayuga and that his father may have been French. Mixed parentage was extremely common, especially in North America's backwoods. So these children generally blended into their surrounding society with little question or suspicion. At some point in his youth, the Oneida people abducted and adopted Shekelani. Such abductions, mirrored by the Haudenosaunee's periodic raids on groups down south, were regarded as an acceptable way to seek compensation, retribution, or to replenish the male population. The overall rate of return among white Indians also reflected a preference for the life of their captors. The same could not be said for native people captured by Europeans. As Benjamin Franklin complained, when an Indian child's been brought up among us, taught our language and habituated to our customs, yet if he goes to see his relations, there's no persuading him to return. When white persons of either sex have lived a while among them, though ransomed by their friends and treated with all imaginable tenderness, in a short time, they take the first op good opportunity of escaping again into the woods from whence there is no reclaiming them. The diplomatic precedence Shikalemi established until his death at Shimogan 20 years later would have unintended though lasting consequences for central Pennsylvania's history. This is when we first hear of Shikalemi, suggesting to James Logan that uh, perhaps he could ignore those unreliable Lenape and Grant, his people, the exclusive right to sell lands in Pennsylvania. So what if his people, the Haudenosaunee, lived 100, 200 miles away to the north? The problem was that claims of territorial sovereignty could also be as flexible as identity. Even though the distinctions between ethnicities, alliances, and allegiances were slowly collapsing, no single group could ever legitimately claimed to represent the interests of all indigenous people in Pennsylvania. Each group pursued its own agenda to ensure survival, if not dominance. But Logan and the Pens had other plans. 
with four overland trails converging at the confluence of the Susquehanna's two branches, Shimokin, which is now modern day Sunbury, quickly became the new crossroads of an Iroquois wanting to expand to the south and British North America with its eyes on the west. By the 1730s, few Lenape remained east of the Susquehanna. So James Logan reassured the Penn family that ignoring the Lenape and dealing exclusively with the Haudenosaunee was in everyone's best interest. The Haudenosaunee could easily dismiss objections to any other group's claims of owning the valley and acting as self-appointed guardians of native interests. By exaggerating the power of a series of trade agreements the Haudenosaunee had with New York, what was called the Covenant Chain, James Logan could falsely portray the Haudenosaunee as an omnipotent, credible, and preferable partner, regardless of how valid their claims were. This new policy of accommodating the Haudenosaunee, coupled with increasing racial animosity, made it more convenient to dispense with the diversity rather than deal with it. And the Oneida agent, Shikolemi, representing the Haudenosaunee, was initially complicit in these schemes. Philadelphia, not Albany, became the new center of negotiations with the Haudenosaunee. When Shikolemi traveled there in the summer of 1731 to meet with James Logan and the Lenape, he introduced another character, Conrad Weiser, on this stage. The Ghanaian Gahaga had adopted Weiser as an adolescent and taught him the Iroquois language. Logan and Shikolemi quickly saw the advantage of having someone comfortably straddling both cultures and welcomed him as a translator. Land transfers arranged by Shikolemi and Weiser over the next 15 years merely drove home the new reality. The Lenape were out of the picture. The Haudenosaunee were the only credible players and all remaining lands east of the Susquehanna were being secretly sold to the Penns. James Logan faced other problems though. Thomas Penn had arrived and was not pleased. It didn't take him long to discover James Logan's unauthorized purchases and strip him of most of his responsibilities. The Susquehanna Valley only provided a brief respite before the Lenape made their way along the banks of the Susquehanna's West Branch. A 23 mile portage over the mountains separated the Susquehanna's headwaters from their new base of operations overlooking the Allegheny River, the Ohio country, and the Mississippi River watershed. The only reminders of that westward diaspora are the whispers of place names heard along those ancient footpaths. Tonkanic, Muncie, Moshannon, Chinklacamoose, Katanning, Venango, and Shenango. The catalog of betrayals and horrors continued resulting in the fateful attacks of October 1755, marking the final attempt by the Lenape and Shawnee to reclaim lands lost along the Susquehanna River. Even though Shikolemi played a prominent role in easing tensions for the next 20 years, it was already too late. Seven years after his death in 1748, world tensions would intrude on central Pennsylvania, culminating in the firestorm of war he worked so long and hard to avoid. At this point, we need to mention the differing views of justice. Both Europeans and indigenous people scalped and tortured, but they did it for different reasons. Native offenders sought justice by personally expressing remorse or by making repairs, restitution, or rituals of reconciliation. Anything worked as long as the offender followed certain expectations and rules and all parties worked toward restoring a sense of community to everyone's satisfaction. Europeans, on the other hand, used torture and imprisonment to preserve institutions such as the state or the church. From the indigenous 
point of view, Europeans no, followed no protocols ensuring the general peace. To them, Europeans were diplomatic ignoramuses. They were wantonly cruel, and they waged war for absurd reasons. The most glaring difference between the cultures was in the case of rape, a rare crime among native people, but one routinely practiced by Europeans. War was no longer limited to isolated skirmishes fueled by vengeance. Native people were to be annihilated through a specific genocidal policy. After all, spreading disease deliberately was cheaper and more efficient than firing bullets. Whether out of appeasement, expediency, or good intentions, Shikolemi initially was complicit in forcing the Lenape out of Penn's woods. Sure, his mission was accomplished, but so was the road to catastrophe. It didn't take long to reduce ethnic identities to two generic categories, categories now based on skin color. Conflicts would be described more and more as between white people and red-skinned Indians. Red skin, a term that originally described the bloody scalps taken from native victims. The year after the murders and abductions along Penn's Creek, Pennsylvania announced that it would pay bounties on the scalp of any native person, regardless of their affiliation. They paid $150 for male prisoners over the age of 12. They awarded $130 for male scalps, for female prisoners over 12, and for males under 12, while a female scalp was worth $50. That increasing Racial animosity eventually made it easier to blame, displace, and justify killing any indigenous people who were in the way, regardless of who they were. Because now they were all becoming viewed as others, as things less than human. The sad truth was that for the rest of his life, and with the constant traveling and never-ending stress taking its toll, Shikolemi was left picking up the pieces and balancing the interests of all these competing groups and individuals, especially James Logan. And don't forget, Shikolemi, Shikolemi named his sons in James Logan's honor, James Shikolemi, and the other son history remembers as Chief Logan. While William Penn's dream of a beloved community never materialized, his heirs finally realized an unbelievable increase in riches from land sales as military conflict swept away all indigenous threats. For the first 30 years, 1702 to 1732, the pens only reaped 12,000 pounds. But profits over the next 30 years compounded 18-fold to 214,000 pounds. A recently published book called The Common Cause by Robert Parkinson details the efforts by our founding fathers, most notably Ben Franklin and Thomas Paine during the American Revolution as they falsely demonized Native Americans and African Americans, portraying them as natural allies of the British accusing them of committing every <clears throat> imaginable atrocity against settlers on the Susquehanna and Appalachian frontier. After all, we had to have a common boogeyman to hate if we were to unify 13 fractious colonies and create an independent country. Revising our origin stories may challenge our visions of the past and make us feel uncomfortable. But learning something new and changing our behavior accordingly usually does. The point is not to regard this new information as a threat. Think of it as an opportunity to learn as we all strive to become better human beings. Today, we think we can read Earth Mother's heartbeat through the peaks and valleys of a seismograph. But you can't read 
her song in her language. You can only sing it. Some societies have created the tinkling piano, the blaring trumpet, the wailing saxophone, and the screeching guitar. But the drum, the drum is universal and timeless. For only the drum communicates her spirit simply, directly, and inexorably. Only the drum refreshes us. Only the drum pulls us back into Earth Mother's womb to hear her heartbeat again, for only the drum makes us reborn. Lines and squares offer no life cycle, no lesson to learn, no sense of place, and no sense of return. Only a life ruled by the circle can do that. At a powwow, singers form a circle near the drum. The strong, steady heartbeat draws all her creations closer to her bosom. Song and dance bring all into communion with the cosmos. One voice lifts off above the group. Others join in, staying within her heartbeat. Dancers enter the circle from the east to repeat the sun's and the moon's daily treks across the sky. Every person finds their connection to Earth Mother. Some move steadily onward as one. Others spin within their own spiral before weaving back into the fold. But all move within her heartbeat. The eagle's feather has floated to the ground in sorrow too many times. And still, the drum beats. The original people honored Earth Mother's unique, unique creations by giving every locale a descriptive place, a sort of descriptive name. Place and home had no true meaning to the invaders. They renamed these places after their kings, their generals, or themselves. Or they stole the souls of faraway places and tried to transplant them here in their new world. But these names had no song to sing. Saka Machine no longer meant meeting place. The invaders called it Philadelphia. The Long Island in the Susquehanna's West Branch was no longer called Mianakia. The invaders gave the surrounding area the incongruous name of Jersey Shore. Tunyata described the large stone that once greeted travelers as it stood on the riverbank. The invaders called this place Huntington. The stone went away, never to return. But Earth Mother's heart kept beating. Many walked on in their life's journey when the invaders sold them blankets deliberately infected with disease. Or for sport, the invaders threw the original people into pits with starving mastiff dogs, specifically bred to kill, and then bet on the outcome. And still, the drum beats. Warriors from the original people continued to defend this land they loved, not necessarily the government that repeatedly broke its promises. And still, the drum beats. For 200 years, Lenape children were told to keep their ancestry a secret because Pennsylvania never lift, lifted its bounty that legalized killing them and collecting their scalps until the 1950s. By that time, the passions of the past and the damage from the deeds had faded into the footnotes and books we can read. And Still, the drum beats, proclaiming that we must kill the Indian to save the man. That government, until the 1970s, took thousands of children from their families, placed them in schools far from their homes, and punished them for speaking their own languages. And still, the drum beats. Some politicians claiming to be educated say that nothing of any use or value, no history existed here before 1492. And still the drum beats. Today, 
Eagles are rejoicing and soaring high above the land again. And still the drum beats for neither Earth Mother's heart nor the truth she witnesses can ever be silenced for long. Thank you. Um, I have a slide here. Do we have that, Robin? The Benjamin West painting. Okay. Um, since we have a few minutes here, we'll give a brief art history lesson. This painting was done in 1764, just after the end of the Seven Years or French and Indian War. It's done by Benjamin West, who was a Quaker. He moved to uh, London because he was a loyalist. Uh, but who's at war at this time is France and Britain. Now, what does the term French and Indian War tell us? That all Indians and all French are against Britain. What's the title of this painting? General Johnson saving a wounded French officer from the tomahawk of a North American Indian. Who's wearing the red uniform? This is William Johnson. Who's wearing a white uniform? It's a French officer. He looks rather ghostly, scared. So this is indicating, symbolizing the death of the French presence. Whereas Johnson here is kind of uh, presenting a, has a commanding presence. What is your opinion about the British ever seeing this? That they're calm, they're in charge, they have a restraining influence, they are civilizing. What about the French? Well, they're weak, they're helpless, and was disdainful. Then you look at the fellow on the left. He's carrying a tomahawk, not a gun. At the center of this painting, what's there is the left hand of the British officer. What's his right hand doing? He's pointing at the dark forest, as opposed to the light at the right of this painting. Now, is he telling the Indian to go back where he belongs? Or is he pointing to lands unclaimed and unconquered? How about the positioning and number of the characters here? Well, the Europeans are on the right, whereas the Indian is on the left. The Latin word for left-handed is sinister. So you can see the symbolism that's going on. This is a the case, this painting is a case of pure propaganda. Does the title tell us to what group? the Indian belongs to? No. Do we learn from this painting that some Indians fought with the French and some fought with the British? Uh, maybe, there seems to be some in the background. So what's the opinion you get about Indians when you see this? Well, they're all inherently bad, untrustworthy, impulsive, savage, uncivilized, unworthy. They are an other. Overall, the opinion you get is that all Europeans, French and British, are allied against all Indians.